everyone. My name is Abridi Shrestha and I am a senior at Skyline High School in Longmont, Colorado. On behalf of Discovery Education, happy Earth Day. We're talking about biodiversity today and we'll be taking you on some really cool deep dives with Ocean First Education. We'll look at how oceans have changed over time, why they've changed, and what we can do to protect them. Let us know you're watching by sending in your photos and tweets on Twitter at DiscoveryEd with the hashtag EarthDay2016. Our first guest today is Graham Kasdan, who is the founder of Ocean First Education here in Boulder, Colorado. Hi, Graham. Hi, Brady. So, could you tell us a little bit about Ocean First? Absolutely. We're a group of impassioned educators, scientists, filmmakers, and divers who are committed to sharing our love for the sea with people everywhere. And we essentially do two things. One is develop and deliver digital marine science curricula for K through 12. And the other is through a variety of channels from our courses, to our partnerships, to our science and research department, connect kids with the sea and bring it to life. Ocean First Education is one of three Boulder-based businesses that uh, together create and support a community of ocean enthusiasts who are passionate about experiencing and preserving our marine environments. That's really cool. You guys do a lot of stuff. So moving on to a more personal note, how did you get interested in diving and exploring the oceans? Well, I grew up in Southern California and uh, had an immediate and innate connection with the sea. And when I was about eight years old, my family took a vacation to the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean. And I had a chance to go snorkeling on a coral reef for the first time. And at one point, we were over a group of divers who were exploring a shipwreck about 60 feet below. And their bubbles were slowly floating up to the surface and bursting against my skin. And I remember distinctly thinking at that moment, I just have to be down there. And it wasn't until many years later, ironically, when I was living in Colorado that I got certified. But I've been diving every year since. That's incredible. So you mentioned Colorado. You're your company works on marine science here, but we're a landlocked state, so why did you choose here? Well, it's a good question, and um, one of uh, the most common questions I get when people find out what we do. And really, I have two answers. One, the simple one, is that uh, I came to Colorado to go to school and never left. And about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to start Ocean First, which is the swim, dive, and travel center that we're in right now. And that ultimately led me to start Ocean First Education a few years later. But the answer that I prefer to give is that we're all connected to the sea no matter where you live. Uh, two out of every three breaths that you take and the majority of the water that comes from the sky uh, originates from the sea. And what's really crazy though is that millions of years ago, Colorado uh, used to be under the ocean. Uh, during the Cretaceous period, uh, Colorado was close to the equator and slowly moved north to where it is today. And we see evidence of that uh, in coral fossils and shark teeth that we find right here in our backyard. We're a lot closer than you think. Yeah. So we have some questions from students. Are you ready? Absolutely. Far away. All right. This question is from Grace Olin at the High School for the Performing and Visual Arts in Houston. She wants to know where you've been diving recently and what unusual things you saw. Awesome. Well, uh, about uh, six months ago, we had the chance to go to Indonesia. And we were diving in Komodo, where the Komodo dragons live, and South Sulawesi, which are both on the eastern half of Indonesia. And where we were in particular is well known for strange and unusual creatures, and lots of them. But one of my favorites is called the peacock mantis shrimp. There are these fascinating creatures that are googly-eyed and have lots of these beautiful colorations, and uh, what I like to say is a charming personality to match. If you don't approach them too quickly, they become curious, and they'll often come out of their hole and come check you out. And they have these club-like appendages that they use for striking. And they're so strong that they've been likened to a 22 caliber handgun with 345 pounds of force per strike. They can literally smash through glass. So they're a really awesome creature and definitely one of my favorites. Is it, are they pretty common? Um, they, you see maybe, if you're lucky, you might see one or two a day. Uh, we probably saw about a dozen over the course of a month. That's really cool. Yeah, they're great. So the next question is from Jonah Welke of Rockville High School in Maryland. What is the biggest difference between what you see in the Caribbean versus what you see in Indonesia? Well, when I first got certified, it was in Belize on one of the largest barrier reefs uh, in the world. And I was completely enthralled with the underwater world. There were so many fish, coral, and other animals 
Um, it was, uh, I, I was hooked and really interested in learning uh, what was going on down there. But it wasn't until a few years later that I had a chance to go to the Indo-Pacific and was completely floored. There were so many more animals and colors, it was literally hard to process. So what I noticed most was, was the biodiversity and the multitude of colors in Indo-Pacific that would literally make Crayola jealous. <laughs> it, it was another world entirely. That's incredible. So I hear you have a video for this? Oh, I do, yes. So uh, I have a video that I like to share, and it's got clips from both the Caribbean and the Indo-Pacific. Okay. Um, and it's a story uh, about my life, uh, but it's narrated by professional voice talent because um, that's not one of my forte's. <laughs> okay, well, it sounds awesome. We should check that out now. Great, let's watch it. The first coral reef I ever explored was in the Caribbean. I was eight at the time. I was just snorkeling but it felt like I had entered this amazing new world. The diversity of life was incredible. The fish, the plants, the coral, everything was so colorful and unique. Moving fish seemed to leap out of the background, while others were so expertly camouflaged that it wasn't until they moved that I even knew they were there. It's no wonder coral reefs are called the rainforests of the sea. Though they make up less than 1% of the marine environment, Coral reefs are home to 25% of the ocean's marine life and are certainly one of our planet's greatest natural attractions. Unlike a rainforest, however, where one must be extremely lucky or a trained observer to catch a glimpse of many of the inhabitants, even a first-time snorkeler will be absolutely overwhelmed by the parade of exotic life that lives on a coral reef. Coral reefs in the Indo-Pacific are very different from those in the Caribbean it wasn't until I dived a few dozen times in both locations that I learned this firsthand. The Indo-Pacific has about five times the amount of fish species and 20 times the amount of coral species as the Caribbean, making it another world entirely. As I would learn later in life, there are a number of reasons, spanning the spectrum from major geological shifts to subtle differences in temperature, salinity, and visibility that have led to the Caribbean and Indo-Pacific becoming their own unique marine ecosystems. All of these factors together affect what lives in a specific area. Tropical coral reefs are very productive ecosystems. Not only do they support enormous biodiversity, they are also of immense value to humankind. It's up to us, divers, snorkelers, conservationists, and ocean enthusiasts of all walks of life to better understand our ocean and what we can do to protect the lifeline of our planet. Both places are incredible. So which one would you say is your favorite? Well, that's a good question. When, when you first learn uh, to dive, there's a tendency to gravitate towards the bigger animals. Sharks, rays, turtles, eels. Um, but once you start to get more dives under your belt, and I'm closing in on about 1,000 dives, you learn to appreciate the smaller stuff. And when I was in Indonesia, we, I spent most of the time, aside from a few dives when we had the chance to look for manta rays, uh, with my head in the coral or under a ledge looking for shrimps, crabs, and nudibranch, which are these shellless mollusks. And um, I love diving all over the world, but if I had to choose one place, it would definitely be the Indo-Pacific. That's cool. A thousand yeah. dives. Yeah, it's crazy. That's, that is crazy. What's, what would you say is like the most crazy encounter you've had during one of those dives? Well, one of my favorites is definitely swimming with humpback whales. Um, majestic creatures that are as long as a bus, weigh tens of thousands of pounds, um, and yet they seem to have an, an amazing awareness and consciousness, um, and just uh, the encounters that you can have in the water um, are just um, unforgettable. So that's definitely something that stuck with me my whole life. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thanks for showing us what it's like to go diving. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Now we've got a couple questions for you. See if your classroom knows the questions and we'll be right back with our next guest. Welcome back to Discovery Education's Deep Dive to the Oceans as we commemorate Earth Day. Make sure to send us your photos and tweets at Discovery Ed with the hashtag EarthDay2016. 
So our next guest today is Dr. Kane DeLacy, who is a marine ecologist. Hi, Kane. Hi, how's it going? So, marine ecologist, what, what exactly does that entail? So a marine ecologist is someone who looks at the interactions between organisms and their environment. And a marine ecologist will look at, say, the interactions between coral reef and the health of the coral reef and how that affects fish po populations. But we also may look at how fish populations affect coral reef health. So how did you get interested in marine ecology? So I grew up in uh, southern Australia, not that close to the ocean, but I would spend my vacations there with my family. And uh, one or two times a year, we would go down there. My parents would throw me in the water with a mask and snorkel and leave me to my own uh, free will. And that's where I got really enamored with the ocean. From then on, about 10 or 11, I uh, saw my first shark and I knew I wanted to get scuba certified. But back then you couldn't get certified until you were about 16 years old. So at 16 I got certified and then after high school I went to college and started studying marine biology. And it was there where I got really interested in the field of ecology because I got interested in how complex coral reefs were and the interactions between all the organisms and now how humans affect those. So then I did a PhD in Western Australia and since then I've been traveling the world's coral reefs doing research on them. How did seeing a shark get you interested in being in the ocean? Did that not scare you away? It didn't scare me at all. In fact, my stepfather was down there below scuba diving wow. with it. And I thought, well, I have to be down there. That's so insane. Since I saw my stepfather and, and the shark interacting quite peacefully, I thought, well, it mustn't be that bad down there. That's cool. So we just saw with Graham that the coral reefs in the Caribbean are very different from the coral reefs in the Indo-Pacific. So could you explain why they're so different? So at the very forefront, it's just a difference in biodiversity. There's a lot more species in the Indo-Pacific than there are in the Caribbean. Um, there are more coral, more fish, more invertebrate species, and they just make the place look different. But what's interesting about the two areas is a geological event that happened about three or four million years ago. So as some of you may be studying, the continents where they are today is not where they've always been. They've moved around the, the globe, and most of the tropical water has been in contact with each other throughout that time. So the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean have generally been able to interact with each other and the organisms be able to pass freely between them. But about three, a, three to four million years ago, uh, an event happened called the formation of the Isthmus of Panama. And it sounds complex, but it's not really that hard to understand. It's just a piece of land that appeared out of the ocean and joined the North American plate with the South American plate. That meant fish couldn't go between the oceans. Fish can't walk across land. So they were stuck. You wouldn't think, No, right? you wouldn't think, right? So they were stuck in either the Indian Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. And then over time, evolution changed the species, and then we have different species found in each ocean today. So how do scientists know that this, that, that was the reason for the biodiversity? So because we don't have a time machine, we can't mm -hmm. go back three or four million years ago. Unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. yes. It would be interesting to watch Ride that Ride a dinosaur out. or something <laughs> like that. So we can't see that physically, but scientists can team up and you can have biologists looking at fish and coral and looking at evidence in those, and you can have geologists and other group of scientists looking at how the earth has changed over time. They will find different information out and they can put those two timelines together and see where common events have occurred, and then they can generate a hypothesis to suggest that that was the event that caused the difference between the Indo-Pacific and the Caribbean. So is the land still moving? Like yeah, surprisingly, we are right now moving. Just sitting right here, right we're still here moving. at a very slow incremental I, rate. I think I can feel it, actually. If you just... Just, <laughs> just hang out. Did you feel that? Yeah. Yeah, well, we hit a little speed bump. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm getting nauseous. <laughs> so we have a question from a student. This is from Foster Clements at Arbor Hills Middle School in Toledo, Ohio. And he asks, what sort of things would scientists be interested in observing on a coral reef? It's a great question, Foster. Thanks for asking it. We are interested in all kinds of things. But more recently, we're very interested in how us humans affect the health of coral reefs. Humans fish, we uh, cause pollution, and we do other damaging things to our coral reefs. So we need to know how our human behaviors affect the coral reef. And they're really complex things that happen. Predators and prey are kind of self-controlling. So the predators control the abundance of prey populations, and we need to understand how they work so that when we take one of those species out, we know what's going to happen to the other one. But what's really interesting about science and, and marine ecology in general is that we never know where something interesting is going to pop up. So parrotfish are a really interesting group of fish. They uh, graze at the coral and to eat the algae because they're herbivores. And as they do that, they take a little bit of coral with them. And coral is limestone, a hard stone-like structure. And as they digest the coral, they can't process the limestone skeleton, so they poop out sand. 
So, Interesting. So when you're on the beach next time, give thanks to the parrotfish because those are the you're guys that give you that. standing in parrotfish poop? Basically. Wow. Yeah. It's clean though. It's clean It's clean, poop. but okay. it is basically parrotfish parrot poop. Parrotfish. Do they look like a parrot? Yeah. So they do look like parrots because they have a fused beak at the front and their teeth oh. come down just like a beak of a parrot. That's super cool. So could you tell us about any special tools or equipment that you use studying underwater? Yeah. This is like my favorite part of marine science really is getting to play with all the toys. So obviously we can't breathe underwater, so we just go scuba diving. And that gets us down to about 30 meters or 100 feet. And we can make observations, we can collect samples and those sorts of things. But beyond that, we need other tools. We can use video cameras. They'll get us down even deeper. Um, but what's really fun is using robots. Underwater? Yes, underwater robots. They don't short circuit or anything? You can no, put we, a robot underwater? We make them waterproof. OK, And uh, we go. call them remote operated vehicles. We tether them to the boat. And we can control them from the surface. Cool. And we can send them very deep. And then we can equip them with eyes, so video cameras. We can put uh, sensing devices on them to measure temperature and salinity. And we can put arms on them as well so they can collect samples for us. How big do they tend to be? So they can range from very small. In fact, you kids can be a part of an uh, ROV project called Open ROV and um, your school can build your own ROVs. That's cool. And also they go, they go to very big, as big as uh, you know, medium-sized cars and minivans. Oh, okay. So it's a lot more than just a wetsuit? A lot more than a, just a wetsuit. A mask? Yeah. So we have another question from a student. This is from Andrea Martinez from Thompson Elementary in Arvada, Colorado. She wants to know what kind of things you're studying. Thanks, Andrea. I study basically fish length. It doesn't sound very interesting. <laughs> but Knowing how long fish grow is really important to understanding the health of a population. When we fish, we tend to take out the bigger fish first. So that means the average size of the population decreases over time. When we try and conserve fish and protect them, we hope that that mean size, the average, goes up over time. So a big project I'm working on now, Ash, is one about the length of sharks. Sharks, as you know, are critical to our marine ecosystems, but it's really hard to swim up to a shark and just put a tape measure on it or a ruler and have you ever tried that? I have. Oh, man. It didn't work out. <laughs> didn't so work out. So we use what's called stereo video cameras. That's basically two video cameras side by side filming the same scene. And we've created great software where we can bring that video footage back to the lab, put it on the computer, and just click on the head and tail of that fish or that shark, and it tells us how long it is. That's cool. So while getting length is really difficult, it's really important also, and stereo video makes it easy. So you work a lot with sharks, it seems. Have you ever been afraid to do research around sharks? I've never been afraid to do research around sharks. Since seeing that first shark early on, I've had this great awareness of um, learning about sharks, understanding their behavior. And when you're in the water as a scuba diver, down deep, watching them swim around, you can tell that they're just curious animals. They uh, may come up close to you, and they're really just interested in finding out what you are and what your business is. They'll come up close and they'll just swim away, just like we are. We're curious about them, they're curious about us. Um, you do need to know what you're doing, and it pays to go with people who are experienced with swimming with sharks. It's probably still a little dangerous. It's still a little yeah. dangerous. I wouldn't uh, swim on top of the ocean if I knew there were sharks yeah. around. Um, but scuba diving with them, it's a different world. You're in the same environment. We don't want any repeat of Jaws. We do not no. want to repeat Jaws, no. All right, well, thank you so much, Kane. You've got a pretty awesome job. Thanks so much. We've got some more questions for your classroom. Stick around because we have one more guest. with our final guest, Kathy Christopher. Hi, Kathy. Nice to meet you, Breedy. So what's your role at Ocean First? Well, I am the Director of Curriculum and Outreach, which means I do a little bit of everything. I create the online courses, I do some of the coding for the interactives in our online courses, the mouse overs, the pop-ups, things like that. I also get the opportunity to get our staff out into local schools and the community to share our love of the ocean, even from here in Colorado. So you got a lot of things to juggle around? I do, but you know what keeps me busy? Yeah. Out of trouble. So we've, some, so we've seen some great underwater footage, and earlier Graham and Dr. Kane were talking about how the reefs are very different. So are there any animals that are specifically found in the Caribbean or only found in the Indo-Pacific? Yes. There are actually endemic species found all over the world. That's animals that are only found in one particular geographical location. If you think about it by the numbers, of course you're going to get more animals in, in the Indo-Pacific because there's four to 5,000 different species of fish just in the Indo-Pacific compared to about 500 different species in the Caribbean. So you do the math. You can, there's going to be a lot more species in the Indo-Pacific. And then when you look at coral, 
although the Indo-Pacific is a larger area than the Caribbean, it also has more species of coral. There's about 1,400 different species of coral found in the Indo-Pacific, compared to only 70 in the Caribbean. So you'll find not just that they look different, the species are different, and the numbers of animals you'll see will be very different. It always slips my mind that coral is actually like an organism, right? You're not the only one. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone forgets that coral are actually invertebrates. And speaking of invertebrates, one of my favorite endemic species is the starry night octopus. Unlike their relatives, the starry night doesn't change color to match, to match its background. They're mostly red in color, but when they get agitated, the starry night throws up these little points of white, and it sort of skitters around on the bottom of the seafloor. They're really neat. You guys will get to see them soon. That's super cool. So. Are there changes happening right now in those areas? There are actually changes happening to coral reefs all around the world. Um, and unfortunately, most of them that we're seeing today that are happening pretty rapidly are due to human impacts. Um, historically, we didn't really consider how our actions would impact the ocean. The ocean always seemed like a really big space that nothing we could do that could ever really cause it harm. Unfortunately, we have seen over time that some of the things we've done have had a really detrimental impact on the coral reefs. One of the things, and Dr. Kane mentioned it, was overfishing. So overfishing is when you take too many of a type of fish or an entire species of fish out of the ecosystem, and that changes the biodiversity completely, um, upsetting everything from the top down. Think of your food chains and your food webs. If you remove one of those pieces, everything sort of falls apart. Well, there's an interesting sort of thing happening in the Caribbean right now with overfishing, but it's not people doing it. It's lionfish. That's weird. It fish, is. Fish, fish on fish, fish yeah. yes. So the lionfish are an invasive species to the Caribbean. They were actually brought there, scientists think, when someone dumped their fish tank out into the ocean, attempting to free their pet lionfish. This is never a good idea. The lionfish do not have any natural predators, so their population is booming. It's just blowing up. And lionfish eat practically everything. So there's a big um, push right now to worry about, the, to get these lionfish out of the Caribbean because they're eating all of the native fish. Um, another thing we're seeing today is uh, with coral bleaching. So coral have a little symbiotic algae that live inside of their tissue called zooxanthellae. And these Bless algae, <laughs> yes, <laughs> zooxanthellae. Oh. They're little algae, they live in the tissue of coral, and they photosynthesize, just like you would expect any other plant or algae to, and they help the coral generate the energy they need to live. Well, when the temperature of the water rises too fast and it becomes too hot, the coral gets stressed out. And when they're stressed out, they let those zooxanthellae out, and then they lose all their color, which is why it's called coral bleaching. But without the zooxanthellae, the, toral, the coral tend to die because they don't produce enough energy to survive. No coral, which we know is an animal, no coral reefs. So you lose that entire ecosystem. So all these changes really tie into this next question we have from a student, actually from somewhere I go to school. Elena Hellenberg from Skyline High School in Longmont, Colorado asks, is there much of a problem with pollution in the oceans? Great question, Elena. Yes, your schools, school pride, should be very prideful right <laughs> hey, now. Elena. <laughs> yes. Um, there is a big problem with pollution in the ocean, and a lot of it, again, um, st starts from land, from people. Um, the land, when we produce garbage, we tend to put it in a landfill. Well, it can end up in the ocean even though it came from a landfill because the wind can blow it in. Streams and rivers can carry trash and other debris out to the ocean. And the problem is not just that it looks gross. I mean, trash in the ocean, yeah, it's never going to be Not attractive. Pretty. No. So you have all this garbage in the ocean. Well, when um, plastic bags fall onto a coral reef, they can smother the coral. Remember, they're living animals. Um, cans and bottles and other debris can break pieces of coral off. They can wrap around animals. Um, and the plastic actually, once it's in the ocean for a long time, it begins to break down into smaller parts. And these smaller parts get digested and eaten by birds and fish and other animals because they think they're smaller fish or invertebrates. So scientists are finding animals with tiny little bits of plastic in their bellies, which no nutritional value there. No, no. That's, that's not good at all. Yeah, so pollution is definitely a problem globally in the ocean. So what's being done to 
help protect the oceans and solve that? Well, scientists are working hard on things. Everyday people are working hard. Everyone who has an idea is welcome to share it. Um, scientists are working with uh, different species of coral to find ones that are more heat tolerant so they can withstand the um, increasing temperatures and not lose their zooxanthellae and become bleached. Um, they're also working with local fishermen to identify some fishing practices and policies that will both be ecologically friendly and keep the fishermen in their jobs. And then you have local conservationists, people who just work in the field, like Bren Smith, who he's a local fisherman. Sorry, not local to Colorado. <laughs> he's been a fisherman his entire life. He's in New England. And he identified and created these things called 3D ocean farms. And they're 3D because they use the entire water column from the very bottom to the very surface. And they plant plant native species so they're ecologically friendly and there's no worry about invasive species. So they have abalone and oysters and kelp that they grow in these 3D ocean farms. And then you have Boyan Slat, who when he was a teenager, very similar in age to you, um, sort of came up with this idea of a way to clean up the oceans. So you brought up the idea of pollution. So he came up with the Ocean Cleanup Array, and it's a solar-powered technology that floats along the surface of the ocean collecting plastic and other debris to remove it from the ocean. So it's not powered by people, it's powered by the sun. You came up with that as a teenager? Yes. Make me feel bad about myself. Now, you're well, you're on not, the right track. I'm not coming up with ocean-saving technology. Give it, a, give it a few minutes, I'm yeah. sure. We'll, we'll get Eventually, you. Eventually, yeah. We'll get you there. Yeah. So I need to know, what can we as students what can we do to protect the oceans, especially living somewhere here so far away from the water? Well, no matter where you live, and here in Colorado, we can do this too, and no matter where you are, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. The less garbage there is, the less opportunity it will be to get into the ocean. That would be my, that's the go-to answer for anybody who's wondering what they can do. The other thing to get a little bit more detailed would be reduce your, re your reliance on plastic plastic water bottles, plastic straws, plastic bags. The next time you go out to eat with your parents, tell them to hold the straw. You don't need a plastic straw. If you really want a straw, they have stainless steel ones that you can wash and reuse. Next time you head to the grocery store, bring your own bags. You don't need to use a plastic one. So that's just a few things that kids, no matter how old you are, students everywhere can say no to the plastic straws, plastic bags, and water bottles. You wouldn't think that something so small could have such a big impact. Yeah. It, it does, and unfortunately it ends up in the ocean, and well, plastic bags in particular, sea turtles love to eat them because jellyfish are one That's of their favorite really foods. sad. Yes. So think sea turtles next time you want to purchase a yeah. plastic bag. From now on, I know I'm going to officially not use straws in restaurants, That's, if that's yes. going to help, if that's going to help. You go, girl. Every little thing. So we're commemorating Earth Day today. Yes. What did you want students to remember most about it? The thing to keep in mind about Earth Day and every day is that you can make a difference. No matter where you are, your choices can make a difference in the world. Um, and I even have a little video clip to show for inspiration. Oh, that's awesome. Let's see it. Think about how much has changed just in your lifetime. Now imagine how much has changed in the ocean over thousands, even millions of years. When we look at the Caribbean, we find about 80% fewer fish and even less coral than we see in the Indo-Pacific. Some of the reasons why are well known. Speciation, natural selection, evolution. But there are others that aren't as well known, like algae and latitude, how near or far from the equator the reef is. And our understanding of the ocean continues to be shaped by new discoveries in science and technology. One particular group of animals, marine invertebrates, has flourished in the idyllic conditions of the Indo-Pacific. The orangutan crab, with its long arms covered by reddish-brown hairs that are often laden with small bits of debris to help camouflage, loves to make its home on the aptly named bubble coral. The fast-moving and rarely seen starry-eyed octopus, in contrast, can be found scampering along the sea floor at night in sandy and rubble areas. It also has a reddish-brown color, but when agitated, white star-like spots appear all over its body, which, unlike most other octopus species, is its only possible color change. But the Indo-Pacific isn't the only place you'll find unique invertebrates. Of all the amazing invertebrates in our ocean, decorator crabs are perhaps one of the most peculiar. Found throughout both locations, 
They use sedentary animals, plants, and even dead coral as camouflage, sticking them to their bodies to hide from or ward off predators. How are humans impacting these creatures and the thousands of others that live in the ocean? What changes are we seeing today? Lionfish have invaded the Caribbean, introduced by people who didn't want their pets anymore and are eating their way through the native fish species. Rising sea temperatures leading to major coral bleaching events and plastic pollution are all contributing factors to the declining health of our ocean. But it's not too late to turn things around. Innovative thinkers and ocean conservationists are designing increasingly sophisticated ways to slow the trend and save the ocean. 3D fishing and the Ocean Cleanup Array, developed by then 19-year-old Boyan Slat, are just two ways regular people are revolutionizing conservation efforts today. Who knows what tomorrow will hold? What ideas do you have? How can you make a difference from where you live? Remember, eventually, everything leads back to the ocean. That was powerful, that was extremely motivating. Got you thinking a lot about how just one person can make a crazy impact, so thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, it was great to be here. So that's all the time we have for today. You can check out all the great projects happening at Ocean First Education by going to their website at www.oceanfirsteducation.com. You can also see an archive of today's program, information about Science Textbook, and information about Discovery's Shark Week in June by visiting www.discoveryeducation.com slash Earth Day 2016. On behalf of Discovery Education, thanks for watching and happy Earth Day.